It's great to be here with all of you today, and I can't think of an endeavor I'd more like to be associated with than the notion of compassion in healthcare, and I so salute the work of the Schwartz Center through its rounds and everything it does to continue to highlight the importance of this issue for so many. Uh, as we've heard from John's data, uh, it's, this is a no-brainer for much of the American public. Almost all patients believe that compassionate care is critical to their medical outcomes, and almost all doctors also believe that that is the case. Uh, so we know that somehow this issue resonates very, very deeply in a profound way that even transcends the research. Now, this research is important. We publish a lot of it at Health Affairs, and I can show you research that suggests how important communication is to the experience of patients about their health care. The research on that exists. I can show you research that shows the importance of shared decision making, that speaking to that issue that John raised about patients being engaged in decisions uh, uh, with their caregivers, care providers. Uh, so this solid research does exist. This is not just an emotional, feel-good, squishy impulse that we all feel that compassion is important. We can prove it. As you can see today, I'm wearing red, you may have noticed. Uh, red, of course, is the traditional color of the Red Cross. Uh, it was the color that was used way back as, uh, in medieval times to symbolize blood, of course, but also charity, compassion, the heart. Uh, it's why we have the Red Cross symbolism, and, and even in the Muslim world, the Red Crescent. Uh, the color red is supposed to hold those connotations for people. And so I thought it would be useful today to just meditate a little bit on that by, uh, as I stand here wearing red, and also to meditate on the importance of compassion. I had the good fortune today to reread uh, Ken Schwartz's memorable piece dating back now uh, 16 years about suffering from lung cancer, uh, uh, as he did before his uh, very untimely death. Uh, and the marvel of, of the compassion that he received during the course of his care and how deeply he valued it, even as he says at one point in the article, just the subtle gesture of someone brushing a hand up against his shoulder, uh, giving him the sense of comfort and compassion that enabled him to battle the illness, to survive uh, ongoing rounds of chemotherapy, to do everything in his power to battle against cancer, and of course we know ultimately the outcome was not successful, but uh, Ken's, uh, even ringing through to this day, is how deeply, deeply valuable that compassion that was shown to Ken and his family was to them. Uh, so I, if you have not had the good fortune of reading that article, I, I urge you very much to do so. This um, story echoes very profoundly for me at this particular point in time in my life. Just at this very moment, my younger sister, uh, Ardeth, who is 52, lies in a hospital bed in my parents' home suffering from advanced lung cancer. And we're told that she herself is now, very unfortunately, just days away from death. Uh, and so as I contemplate her care over the course of the time since she was diagnosed uh, last December with already metastatic small cell lung cancer, uh, I marvel at the compassion that she has received. Uh, when you're the health correspondent of the news hour, followed by the health policy uh, he editor of a health policy journal, you can call some high level people uh, when your sister is diagnosed with lung cancer. And from the very top, uh, calls to even the uh, acting head of the National Cancer Institute, John Niederhuger. Uh, the scientific advice, of course, that I got from John was invaluable, but the compassion, the compassion of his care is something. Personally, I, I will never forget. Uh, the compassion that my sister experienced among her caregivers, her oncologists at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, or even later at Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, where she went for some additional consultations, and even to Memorial Sloan Kettering. Just extraordinary care and concern that she experienced. Uh, even the lowly uh, weekend ER director at Sound Shore Hospital in Westchester County, New York, who took her in when her brain metastases had gotten so advanced that she began to suffer some delusions about who she was and had to be rushed to an emergency room. Even that 
ER director took great compassion on my sister and was able to really perform a miracle in U.S. healthcare, which was to get her transferred across state lines to another hospital in the middle of the night, seamlessly, no fragmentation of care, and put her back into the hands of some caregivers uh, at another hospital who knew her well. This is extraordinary. None of them, though, I think, epitomizes the, com the need for compassion care as much as one of my sister's current caregivers. She's a direct caregiver, a home care worker named Elizabeth, who had just come into my sister's life within the past month. And because of Elizabeth uh, and her long experience in working with patients with advanced cancer, my sister, who I assure you believes to this day that a miracle will happen and she'll survive. My sister, because of Elizabeth's urging, was finally able to accept the intervention of hospice. My parents were finally able to accept the need for additional support to help care for my sister in my home, in my parents' home. And their collective, what, what my family now owes to the compassion of this woman really cannot be, it simply cannot be stated in words. When I think about uh, compassion in the current environment, and John showed some data about uh, physicians and others concerned about the current healthcare system, how it may militate against compassion, how the stresses and strains of money or productivity or what have you uh, impede their, they believe impede their ability to be compassionate. I think about a line that many of you may have heard, some, some of you may have attended the famous uh, Revels series that comes around at the holiday season around the country. One of the more famous ones being, of course, just over the river in Cambridge. And every year in Revels, and Revels, although it's cast in the Christmas season, really, as you know, those of you who have seen it, it's a, to a large degree a celebration of the winter solstice. That dark day of the year, the darkest day of the year, December 21st, which is coming, as we know, when uh, throughout the centuries people celebrated light and the coming of spring because they were stealing themselves for the dark winter ahead. When I think about uh, a line from the Revels, it's one that's read in every Revel celebration around the country every year, and it, it actually evokes a sentence from a letter that was written centuries ago by, I believe, a 15th century Italian priest who wrote a letter to around the Christmas season to a friend and said in that letter, uh, no peace lies in the future that is not to be found in this, the present instant. When I think about that line, I think about the stress and strains that people in our current healthcare system believe about compassion. They believe that compassion may not be possible in this, the present instant with insurers breathing down their necks, with hospital CEOs urging them on to new heights of productivity. And I think about this line, no peace lies in the future that is not found in this, the present instant. What compassion lies in the future that could not be found in this, the present instant? What compassion was in the past that we fantasize was there? Was it when Clara Barton was walking through the, tent, the crowded tents of soldiers wounded in the Civil War? Was it uh, Florence Nightingale who preceded her doing the same thing with, uh, with soldiers centuries, a century or so earlier? Was it as I have seen myself uh, in Aceh in Indonesia after the tsunami where amid complete devastation, community health care workers were comforting the people who had lost almost all their families? Was it, as I have also seen in Rwanda, where after the genocide, uh, compassionate nurses were comforting, in one case, as I saw again with my own eyes, an HIV-infected woman whose entire family had been eradicated in the genocide and was living with the HIV that she had uh, carried forward as a consequence of repeated rapes during the war? When is compassion possible? Compassion can only be found in this instant and in every instant. And so as we 
contemplate the dark day ahead and think about the dark days in all of our lives, we understand just how important the work of the Schwartz Center is. And as I say, I'm most, most delighted and honored to be here today to moderate this next session. So let me...